This afternoon, Books and Books, in collaboration with the Churchill Society, is very happy to welcome Mr. David Locke, presenting his new book, No More Champagne, Churchill and His Money. Mr. Locke studied history at Oxford under Richard Cobb and Theodore Zeldin. After a career in financial markets, he founded a business that advises families on looking after their investments, tax affairs, and estates. Churchill and His Money is his first book. It reveals for the first time the full extent of the iconic British war leader's private struggle to maintain a way of life instilled by his upbringing and expected of his public position. Mr. Locke uses Churchill's own private records, many never researched before, to chronicle his family's chronic shortage of money, his own extravagance, and his recurring losses from gambling or trading in shares and currencies. Throughout the story, he highlights the threads of risk, energy, persuasion, and sheer willpower to survive, I'm sorry, sheer willpower to survive that link Churchill's private and public lives. Here to tell us more about it, please give a very warm welcome to Mr. David Locke. Thank you very much, Victor, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming this afternoon. I'm, I'm delighted to uh, be here in Miami. It's, it's the first uh, stop of my U.S. tour. And uh, it was one of the first stops for Churchill in the United States 150 years ago, when in, in 1895, when he was on his way to Cuba. To, as a 20-year-old, he just lost his uh, father, uh, his father had died in his mid-40s. He'd left no money for his children, his two sons. He'd, he'd left what he had to uh, his wife in trust. And uh, w one of the reasons Church came out was to seek some adventure, uh, but also to write some his first articles for a newspaper, the Daily Graphic. And he was going to write those for five pounds a time. In today's money, that's about five or six hundred dollars each from the uh, struggle that was going on in Cuba between the Spanish forces and, and, the, and the Cubans. And then he next comes back as in, in 1946, January 1946, nearly 70 years ago, i.e. 50 years later, and this time he's the victor, one of the victors of the Second World War. And he's staying just down the road here at, on North Bay Road, he's the guest of a Canadian ship owner. And uh, an unmarked British embassy plane flies down from Washington while he's here. And it's got two people on board. It's carrying two passengers. One is a naval intelligence commander by the name of Ian Fleming, later to create fiction's probably most uh, remunerative package or character, James Bond. And the other is a much smaller guy called Emery Reeves, who was Churchill's press agent before the Second World War and who helped to sell his newspaper articles all over Europe. And Churchill had asked for him to come down because he had decided to write his Second World War memoirs. He'd hesitated quite a long time, or appeared to hesitate because he, the tax side looked like being punitive. But his advisors had found a way through the tax tangle. And so um, Emery Reeves was summoned down. And Churchill said to him, look, when the moment comes, we've just still got a few steps put in place. But when the moment comes, I want you to help me sell these worldwide. And they, uh, they sold for today's equivalent of $45 million. So there's the contrast, you know, between his first article that he comes down to write in, in 1895 and the package that he put in place with help in uh, 1946, both ends of it here in Miami or near Miami. And so I thought today what I would try to do, uh, you know, is explain a little bit about what went on in between. Um, because you may well think that Churchill, uh, as the um, privileged 
son or grandson of a duke on one side and, and grandson of a, a Wall Street adventurer, Leonard Jerome on the other side, uh, was born with a silver spoon in his mouth and that all was comfortable and hunky-dory. But in fact, it was very, very different. And he was on a financial cliff edge, lived on a, literally a financial cliff edge, or beneath it and hauled up by rescuers for really for his entire life until uh, the middle of the Second World War when the tide turned in favor of the Allies and uh, American money in particular got really interested in, in um, following Churchill. But you may think, why, you know, why another book on Churchill? There are, there, there are so many people have written just about everything they could find to write on on Churchill. But what I discovered was that nobody had followed through this seam of the money. I, th I think quite a few people who have studied him at all closely know that you know, at various points of his life, money was a problem. When it protrudes above the surface, it's nearly always as a problem. Uh, and what I had discovered in my professional career as a, as a wealth advisor or a private banker, as it's sometimes called, was that you could get to know somebody really well through, through money, what they did with money, when they either had it or didn't have it, how they behaved, you know, what their priorities were between helping their children or their getting a second home or taking expensive holidays abroad or um, going down to the casino, you know, those sort of choices that they make tell you a lot about a person. So I was, I was surprised that nobody had, um, when, I, when I looked to find whether anybody had written about him and his money and found that um, nobody had. And the first day I turned up at the Churchill archives and said, I, they, ask, they, they ask you, you know, what your field of, subject, uh, your field of study is going to be. And I said, Churchill and his finances. And they looked at me and said, well, I'm very sorry. I think you're, you, know, you may be on a wasted trip because most of the papers are closed. But in fact, they're not. And, and I knew from the catalog that they're not. It's a common misperception. I mean, and th in a way, this is one of the great things about Churchill is he's not, you know, he's not proud. Um, so he never, he, he didn't put any, he collected everything he could and shoved them in his archives. All his old bills, all his old tax demands, um, his bank statements showing overdraft over overdraft, you know, demand on, the demand from bankers that he pay up, reduce his overdraft or reduce his loans. It's all still there. I can think of a few politicians today who might control their archives a bit more carefully, but, but not Churchill. So, uh, I, and I, then I was lucky having to spend three or four years researching it, and I know, you, you know, I found one or two holes where, where, where say, bank statements were missing, or, although they're there basically from 1907 onwards, but there are a few patches where they're missing, and I applied to the Churchill's daughter, who was then still alive, Mary Soames, and she very kindly gave me permission to go to his bank and um, get access to them there. And so I ended up with, with and, and then the rest of the family took their cue from that, and I got permission to get some documents from the family solicitors that weren't in the archive, and, and ended up with, um, you know, just about the most complete access that I could have wanted, really. So. I thought today I'd, I'd just try and give you, in, in uh, half an hour or so, um, a bit of a, a pen portrait, and particularly look at the American dimension of his finances, which, are, which is very, very important. And then we can have some questions and answers, if you'd like that. Um, I, I mentioned that Churchill, on, on his father's side, he was the grandson of a duke. Now, there are only about a dozen dukes in Britain. They were somewhat like princes. They had large retinues. They had usually needed very large landed estates to sort of bear the costs of those retinues. But the, the Churchill family's dukedom, uh, the Duke of Marlborough, they were called, was one of the more recent uh, newer creations because it, it was put in place to commem commemorate John Churchill's victory, as, or, yeah, the big victory at Blenheim and then other victories over the French leading allied European countries at the beginning of the 18th century. So it was quite new. And it, it had been set up with uh, money granted by Parliament, by the Queen, uh, to commemorate and in gratitude for the victories, and also by various ally, uh, princes of the Low Countries who were grateful for uh, 
Churchill's leadership of successful leadership of the campaign against the French. So paintings that turned out to be old masters, rare books, porcelain gems, you know, it all came pouring into Blenheim Palace. And um, the first duchess was pretty astute too. She built up the land surrounding the Blenheim estate and they ended up with about 100,000 acres. Now that, you know, it sounds impressive, but in fact it's, it, it's sort of on the low side for dukes. And the problem was that, um, that the next uh, five, six generations blew it, basically. They, they had a mania for collecting, for gambling, for mistresses who were expensive to keep up. And um, by the time Churchill's grandfather was born, he was sort of defending the, the last, the core of the estate. In fact, most of that core protected by Act of Parliament. Um, so there wasn't much spare. And on his maternal side of the family, which is the American side of the family, uh, his grandfather, Leonard Jerome, had had um, a huge early career in Wall Street. He was one of the early Wall Street legends. But that, in those days, that meant up and down. You know, that he made and lost several fortunes in his um, brief glory years in Wall Street. And by the time Churchill was born, he was on a sort of terminal downward trend, I'm afraid. Um, so each family looked to the other, thought that the other side had the money to establish this young couple, but in fact, neither did. And it, by, by you know, standards of the day, they were given, I mean, it was a comfortable marriage settlement. It, it was comfortably endowed, but it wasn't anything to write home about. And it, it certainly wasn't enough for their, to keep up their standard of, the standard of living they'd been, both been brought up to, really. And they both had very expensive tastes. And from the word go, they were behind the curve. And they were having to borrow to, um, to, to keep up the s sort of standards expected of, a, of an ambitious young politician, as, as Churchill's father, Lord Randolph Churchill, was. And they were borrowing from insurance companies, they were borrowing from unofficial money lenders, uh, they were paying the tradesmen late. You know, all, all the normal sort of characteristics of a rather fading British aristocratic um, family. And this is what Churchill grew up amongst. And his father was pretty ill and died in his mid-40s, as I mentioned. And, and things would have been worse had he not, right at the end of his life, led a gold prospecting expedition to southern Africa. Now, this was a sort of respectable thing for a duke's son. He was the second son to do. No, he, wasn't, he wasn't to besmirch himself by getting involved in business. That was beneath a duke's son. But it was socially acceptable to lead a gold prospecting expedition arranged by the Rothschilds. And off he went. He, he got money from friends and family uh, who invested. And they, they went off to uh, what's now Zimbabwe to look for gold. And unfortunately, they found nothing, absolutely nothing. And all his investors lost all their money. However, on the way home, he, uh, was, he was given a tip that the next big area for gold mining in South Africa would be the Witzvortesland. And he was offered a chance to participate in a, in a mining uh, company which had found some gold and was expected shortly to go public. And he, put, he borrowed some money, put it in, and the shares went up a hundredfold in the two or three years that he owned them before he died. So although Churchill in his book, Winston Churchill, writes that his father died when his assets equaled his liabilities, um, that is, I have found, nonsense. Um, the, the, the ledgers at Rothschilds, which still survive at the bank's headquarters today, show quite clearly that his father died with an estate that in dollar terms today would be about five and a half million dollars. Um, correction, that's pound sterling. In, in dollars, it would be seven or eight million. Seven or eight million dollars. Um, and he left that in trust to his wife. He didn't leave any specific allowance for his sons. Quite unusual in those days. He left it to his wife. She was to enjoy only the income, as is often the way with trusts. 
She, however, in very intelligent, well-educated lady that she was, did not understand the distinction between capital and income. <laughs> and the lawyers were asleep on the job. They were, you know, they were, they were hopelessly old-fashioned, the Churchill family lawyers. And they didn't put in place any sort of controls to make sure that she just spent the income. So now her second husband, she didn't marry, remarry for another five or six years, but her second husband alleged that she spent on average about three quarters of a million dollars a year, today's money, on clothes alone. He may have been, you know, he may have been uh, following his own side of the story a bit, but uh, that, that was what he said. And she was certainly extravagant. You know, she'd been brought up in Paris in her teenage years. She knew the best Parisian couturier, and once having tasted them, she could never give them up. So there follows this period when uh, young Churchill is in his early 20s. He, he has, um, he's in the army. He's been posted out to India where young British soldiers are generally bored out of their minds. They can play polo and they can drink. Actually, he, he educated himself while he was there because he'd never been to university. He read very widely, but he did spend a lot of money. And she was doing the same at home, and there wasn't very much money to go around. So we have this wonderful correspondence, um, which forms one of the early chapters of my book, where mother and son are writing to each other each week. The letters take two or three weeks to travel from Britain to India, so nobody's quite sure. It's quite difficult for, for those, you know, if you're researching the archive, to know who's responding to exactly which letter. But um, I thought I'd, I'd read an excerpt from a couple of them because they sort of set, they set the scene rather nicely of both the characters and the problem of, of uh, lack of money. So this is, this is Lady Churchill writing to her son um, because she's been summoned to his bank, which is also her bank, to, um, to make good a check that he's written without having any money in the account. Parents will be familiar with this um, story. She was less pleased to be summoned to the bank in February to guarantee a check her son had written on an empty account. It is with unusual feelings that I sit down to write to you my weekly letter. I went to Cox's this morning, that's the bank, and find out not only have you anticipated the whole of your quarter's allowance due this month, but 45 pounds besides, and now this check for 50 pounds, and that you knew you had nothing at the bank. I must say, I think it is too bad of you. I have told them at Cox's not to apply to me in future, as you must manage your own affairs. I am not responsible. If you cannot live on your allowance from me and your pay, you will have to leave the 4th Hussars, his army regiment. And he, a short time later, <laughs> for his part, is, is asked to sign some documents, sort of regularizing the fact that she has inadvertently spent a quarter of the trust money that was supposed to be protected and was to form his future inheritance. So he writes back to her, speaking quite frankly on the subject. There is no doubt that we are both, you and I, equally thoughtless, spendthrift and extravagant. We both know what is good and we like to have it. Arrangements for paying are left to the future. We shall very soon come to the end of our tether unless a considerable change comes over our fortunes and dispositions. <coughs> you can sort of hear the orator of the future, perhaps, in these words, can't you? I sympathize with all your extravagances, even more than you do with mine. It seems just as suicidal to me when you spend £200, $30,000 today, on a ball dress, as it does to you when I purchase a new polo pony for 100 pounds, $15,000. And yet, I feel that you ought to have the dress and I the polo pony. <laughs> <laughs> the pinch of the matter is that we are damned poor. Um, so, Churchill deals with this by doubling up as a war correspondent as well as an army officer. Uh, he starts writing and under, under the byline, a young officer, he starts 
making sure that he's uh, posted to the front and getting involved in the action. And he gets his mother back in London to uh, sell his articles. You know, she's a great PR agent. She knows everybody. She's sleeping with half of London. And... Um, <laughs> well, actually, the Prince of Wales, at the, back. <laughs> <laughs> the heir to the throne. Um, so she, he, he, uh, he, he f writes that Afghanistan, uh, as it would now be called, the Northwest Frontier, as it was then, and then he makes sure she gets him posted down to the Sudan in Egypt, where he takes part in the last charge by the British cavalry at Omdurman in 1899. And, and he, he, she suggests that he collect the articles into a books, and he does that, and it sort of works. You know, they're bought by, uh, he engages an agent, and they're bought by publishers, and they get quite well reviewed. And so um, he thinks, well, I can leave the army because it's not that well paid, and I will go into, I will write professionally. And, th and, and, and I can then go into politics, which is my destiny. That's what my father did. So he, he, early in 1900, he leaves the army. And as he does, rumblings start for what turns out to be the Boer War between Britain and the, the Boer Republic, the sort of Dutch-based uh, Republicans down in Southern Africa. And uh, by then, he knows some other newspaper owners. So there's a bidding war for his services. Uh, and he plays them pretty well. And, and he ends up with the highest contract that any war correspondent has ever had, age 24. He's on $40,000 a month, today's money, from the time the ship leaves Britain to the time it gets back, plus expenses. And Churchill's expenses were always generous. So, and then even better in a way, as soon as he gets there and starts reporting, he is captured. And he plays rather a heroic role in his capture. If you've ever seen the film Young Winston, it features large in that film. He's captured by the Boers. He claims non-combatant status. Um, they don't look like respecting that and releasing him, so he escapes. And um, he gets back to southern Africa, and he is, becomes a hero, widely reported on, both in Britain and over here. And so he, uh, he, he is invited to make lecture tours of Britain and America. Uh, and he does that. And in Britain, it's a huge success. He's on a slice of the takings at the door, and, and he averages $15,000 a night in today's money. He comes over here and is a bit disappointed that, that, that he doesn't do as well. But still, he, by, by the time he's 25, he has made, uh, in today's money, 1.5 million US dollars. He's a, he, he, he is, you know, in today's terms, a millionaire at a fairly young age, all self-made. None of that has come from Marlborough money or Marlborough acreage or anything. And, uh, you know, for those of you who, 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 are, who wonder if there's any linkage between his money and his public affairs, I would say look at that fact because it is round about exactly then that he switches from the Tory party to the Liberal party, which is the party of self-made men. And people try to explain this move in terms of, you know, attachment to free trade or whatever it is. But in fact, I think you'll find that he is mentally, he thinks like a self-made man not somebody who had inherited lots, because he hadn't inherited lots. He didn't, he'd, I mean, he'd inherited expensive tastes in clothes and things, but he hadn't inherited any money or, or land. He'd made it himself. So there he is at the beginning of the 1900s. He's 25 years old. He's newly elected an MP rather more quickly than he expected. He's got $1.5 million in the bank, and all seems to be well. However, the, the first 10 years, you know, in those days, members of parliament were not paid. Uh, and and the, really the story of the first decade of the 20th century, for as far as Churchill is concerned, is that he spends, he goes through the money. Uh, and he does that quicker than most people. In fact, one of the things I've found was that, uh, you know, f fairly uh, solid evidence that a, a well-to-do bachelor in London leading quite an active social life in the 1900s, early 1900s, needed um, a thousand pounds a year, which is, in today's money, $150,000 a year. But Churchill, I, I also can see from the records, his secretary kept a record of what he spent, he spent about 40% above that going rate. He spent it on horses for polo, 
he spent it on his clothes, everything was lined in satin, even his hat boxes were lined in satin, you know, every, everything. I am easily satisfied by the best, he is said to have said. And um, so he, his spending level was just very high all, 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 all the time. <coughs> and uh, he, um, he went through it. He sort of man managed to slow down the rate of expenditure by not paying a lot of the bills for a long time. <laughs> um, he paid doctors and dentists because he knew he might have to go and see them again pretty quickly. But you know, his tailor or above all his wine merchants, he paid very, very slowly. He, pa he paid the tailors up to five or six years late. He paid the wine merchants he used as a sort of second bank. Every time, you know, he would re regularly order and they allowed him just to pay down a little bit and his outstanding balance grew and grew and grew until by the outbreak of the First World War in today's money, the outstanding balance with his wine merchants is $75,000 or a bit more. And then, I mean, by now he's married. He didn't marry money, which is, and some of his family hoped he would marry the rich heiress, as she was called, this creature who came with money. But uh, he didn't. He, he undoubtedly married for love. And Clementine Hosier didn't have, I mean, her parents had split up and um, they, 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 I'm afraid she brought very, very little to the table, except her personality and her education. And um, so he, you know, he was starting to borrow long term from the bank by the time the First World War came out. And then the war was not good for anybody's finances. In fact, Churchill did relatively a bit better than most because he was in the cabinet for a chunk of it. Then he went out to the fight for six months. Then he came back and he got very, before he rejoined the government, he got very lucrative um, journalism contracts during the First World War. And there was a sort of little period in 1916-17 when he felt very confident financially for al almost the first time. And he bought a country house and had dreams of farming there. And then he, rejoined, he was invited to rejoin the government in 1917. He had to give up the journalism, and the salary of a cabinet minister was not equal to the expenses of the Churchill household, and it all started to go wrong again, and his debts built up. And in, in, in here, I, I uh, detail, in 1920, the first sort of mini rescue um, where somebody bails him out of a situation, you know, he's insolvent basically in 1920. Um, and uh, he, he, somebody writes out a check for, it, it's a fairly small rescue by Churchill standards. It, it, it's in dollar terms about $225,000. Um, the guy who, who gave it to him very conveniently died about two or three years later, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> He didn't have to repay it, or it doesn't look as though he had to repay it. And then in 1921, there's a sudden stroke of luck. There is a train crash in Wales. And one of the people killed in it is a remote Irish cousin of Churchill's. Um, like Winston Churchill, they, they shared a great grandmother, a woman called the Marchioness of Londonderry. And the Marchioness had, in her will in 1862, put her Irish estate really to benefit her younger grandchildren, because the older grandchildren were always looked after by the sort of the main estate. You know? So the problem for these mothers, particularly felt it, was what about the younger children? So she had created this settlement, and all her Irish estates were to go for the benefit of her younger grandchildren in each family, and starting with the one, the London Derrys themselves. Uh, but uh, they, you know, the last of these was killed in that train crash, the last one alive, and he had no children. So it jumped across to the Churchills, Lord Randolph was dead, so it went into Winston Churchill's hands. I mean, it was most unexpected, really. The new thanks for train crash. But there it was, after death duties, etc. It was um, four and a half, five million dollars. Thank you very much. Um, a few months later, his mother died. And... She, she had an accident and uh, hemorrhaged her in her leg. She died unexpectedly. And so what remained of the trust, family trust money, half came to Winston Churchill, still in trust, so he could only get the income from that. But suddenly, you know, his finances were transformed. And Clementine, who had been very anxious about their money and the fact they couldn't pay their bills, was overjoyed. 
And, and uh, I thought I'd read you another little bit here. Churchill's first step on hearing the news was to arrange an immediate meeting to soothe the fears of his bank manager, William Bernau, with whom a crisis had been brewing since his loans and overdraft had now reached almost 28,000 pounds in today's money. And I give conversions throughout. So that's sort of um, close to $2 million. Clementine's priority was to attack their pile of unpaid bills. What would you really wish done about the bills, she asked her husband. In the first flush of the rosy news, you suggested paying them off, and you said I was to send them all to you to have dealt with. It would be heavenly if this could be done, but I don't know if you really mean it. The following day, she was still absorbing the news. I can't describe the blessed feeling of relief that we need never, never be worried about money again, except through our own fault, of course. It is like floating in a bath of cream. Well, unfortunately, she wasn't floating in that bath of cream for very long, because within literally, um, well, by the end of the decade, by the end of the 1920s, Churchill had spent or lost it all. He, he gambled much more heavily than he let on to his wife. How do I know that? Because I can see the letters he writes to her, which say, darling, not a great night at the casino last night, sorry, but you know, I was playing low, so don't worry. And then I can look at the bank statements and see how much he's drawing from the casino the night before. And they don't match. And in, in 1923, he, he certainly lost um, 2,000 pounds, 150,000 pounds today. So to, to, you know, a short quarter of a million dollars in 1923. Um, then um, there was Chartwell, their country home. I don't know if any of you, if you, go to, if you go to Britain, if you go near London, do go to Chartwell, their country home. It's now um, owned by the National Trust. Lots of people go. It's a, lovely, it's a lovely visit. And he had bought it. He bought it after his inheritance as a sort of tumble-down Victorian manor house with slimy sort of wet all over it. You know, it was in bad shape. And, but his conversion project was horribly mismanaged. And, and he, uh, you know, he chose the wrong architect, basically. He went down every week, changed his mind about stuff. And they spent together more than three or four times what he had planned to spend. And, and still there were problems with the water getting in and plaster falls. <laughs> um, so that's where a lot of it went. I mean, over half of it went there. And, um, and then the rest went in 1929, and here we come to an important American dimension, because Churchill had just stopped being, in May 1929, he uh, stopped being Chancellor of the Exchequer. From 1925 to 1929, believe it or not, with this record of financial <laughs> management, he was eminently qualified to be Chancellor of the Exchequer. And some of the stuff he gets up to with the Chairman of the Inland Revenue to pay less tax is, is almost unbelievable worth reading the book just for that, I think. Um, but in, uh, as he loses power in 1929, Churchill decides to take a break from Britain, which he'd done once before when he lost power. You know, he took six months away. The previous time he'd been to France, this time his agent said, go to America. If you want to build up your American readership, you must go to America. So he said, OK, I will. And he lined up through his friend Bernard Baruch, who had become a great friend of his during the First World War, when they worked on munition supplies together. He lined up suitable hosts so that he wouldn't have to pay very much as he went, <laughs> all or, you know, strategically placed all around. And, and he set off, and they went first, he, his brother, and their two sons, to Canada. Uh, free transport on Canadian Pacific in return for giving four speeches and a free railway car, all the way, private railway car, all the way across Canada, which he thought was wonderful. You know, it was a, a wonderful habitation, he said. And as he went across the prairies, he saw these oil derricks springing up, and he wrote home and he says, Canada is the most fantastic, you know, you wouldn't believe the amount of opportunity out here. If, 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 I'm not, if I don't become leader of our party soon, I'm going to give up politics, and I'm going to come here and make a lot of money for us. And meanwhile, I'm going to start, make a start now. And, and he, he had just concluded a contract for a major book on his ancestor, the Duke of Marlborough. He'd been paid a, 
an advance equivalent to over a million dollars. And he'd promised it to the bank to reduce his borrowings there before he left the country. But when he got to Canada and he saw all this stuff going on, he, he wrote to the publisher and said, by the way, please don't send it to the bank. Please send it to my stockbrokers. Because there are so many opportunities for money making here and I, I, I must get a move on. So he started investing in small oil companies as he went across Canada. Uh, and then when he got to Vancouver, he, he opens a, a US share account. And then he went down the West Coast and he opened another US share account in San Francisco. And he writes home saying, darling, you won't believe the amount of money we're making. Because shares were still, you know, it was a boom. It was a, a bull, a, the last stages of the bull market. And uh, he says, we've made so much money since I left. And I've hardly had to pay a bean. It's, it's, life's looking good. And he said, they put the share prices up in the hotel windows and they scrub them out and put up the new ones because they're going up so fast. And um, then he went across to New York. And when he got to New York, Bernard Brew, who was a gr one of the big Wall Street operators, sat him down on the desk beside him introduced him to his brokers. I mean, Bernard Baruch was dealing even in money of the day in sort of half million dollar tickets. And, and Churchill must have thought, well, I better. <laughs> so he started dealing big time. I mean, he, he's in and out of stocks in 24 or 48 hours, selling short as well as going long. And his turnover, um, his turnover in uh, one of the weeks in October uh, well, well, the first week that he's there was four million dollars, in today's money, four million dollars in the week. His turnover in the second week is six million dollars. Um, and, and then it's, while he's there, it starts to crack. And, uh, you know, the first day it really cracked, or it was a, a Thursday, but the, the big banks sort of got together and bought back and they managed to contain it to a two or three percent drop. And then on the Friday, and Churchill was leaving on the Monday night. On the Friday, it was, a bit, it was a bit worse. I forget what the exact fall was on the Friday. Uh, but he, he had consulted his broker who said, oh, it's just a passing thing, buy more, you know, as they're falling, buy more. So he did. And then on the Monday, prices fell by uh, 12%. The market as a whole fell by 12%. And there was a, there was a dinner party that night uh, to say goodbye to him, organized by Bernard um, Baruch. And um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start on the Monday morning. The first inkling of serious losses did not come until Monday morning when Churchill tried to make sense of his broker Hutton's valuation based on prices at the close of business the previous Friday evening. He cabled Hutton urgently to ask whether there had been a mistake. No, came the reply. <laughs> Share prices to continue to fall on the Monday and showed no sign of stopping. The Dow Jones index ended the day down by a record 13%. Bernard Baruch had arranged a dinner that evening for New York's financial elite to bid Churchill farewell. The guests were stoic. And Churchill's parting toast was to friends and former millionaires. <laughs> The full extent of his own losses did not begin to sink in until the following day, Tuesday, 29th October, while Churchill crossed the Atlantic. He used prices from the ship's ticker tape to recalculate his fortunes. The Dow Jones index had lost another 12%. Over two trading days, 30 billion of the market's 80 billion value had disappeared. That evening, the ticker tape did not stop recording its litany of losses until 7.45 p.m. And Churchill found, I mean, when he did all the sums, he found he'd lost, well, he always told his friends it was $50,000, but I, I make it at least $75,000, which in today's money is about one and a, one point two five, one and a quarter million. Um, and that would have been worse if Baruch did not, had not transferred to him some gains that he'd made on a couple of his own trades, because he felt a bit embarrassed that his friend had lost so much. Now, the thing is, you know, I mean, Churchill dreaded getting home. He had to admit to his wife that he'd lost all this money. He'd lost the advance for the Marlborough book before he'd even written a word. He was going to have to admit to the bank he'd lost all this money and he had diverted the money which he'd promised them. 
So, you know, things were not good for the remainder of um, November when he got home. But he, uh, he writes an article for a big British newspaper, the Daily Telegraph, at the end of November, which is published early in December. And I think this, you know, this is, this is remarkable. When he's facing this very black outlook himself, what he writes is this. Under my very window, a gentleman cast himself down 15 stories and was dashed to pieces. No one could doubt that this financial disaster, huge as it is, cruel as it is to thousands, is only a passing episode in the march of a valiant and serviceable people who by fierce experiment are hewing new paths for man and showing to all nations much that they should attempt and much that they should avoid. So I think you can see in that that he, he certainly hasn't lost his faith in America. And in fact, Churchill, because he spends so much time in America, has understood the, the depth of, of the, the American economy and the resources, the population. And he knows it better, really, than any other British politician of his time. He comes back here in 1931, 1932 to, to lecture, to earn money. He keeps investing in U.S. shares throughout the 1930s to try to sort of get rid of this debt with, with which he's landed himself. He writes like crazy in the 1930s to, to try and sort of keep himself above water. A lot of what he writes is about the U.S. Uh, he sells a lot of his articles into the U.S. market. And he, he really has a much, much deeper understanding of America's power and resources than any other British politician. So when it comes to the war and when he finds himself in a position of leadership, you know, he's, he, immediately his strategy is to bring America into the war. Everything he does in 1940-41 is geared to bringing America into the war, if possible, alongside Britain. And, and he was making progress. You know, it was slow. FDR found it difficult. But he was making progress before, of course, suddenly the thing was transformed by Pearl Harbor and in America comes. And it took a few months before the tide turned, but the tide did turn, and when it turned, Churchill you know, emerges as this rather heroic figure, because he had stood alone, and American money starts to really sort of zero in on his story. And he sell, during the war, he sells a lot of film rights to his old books, to American studios. Uh, and uh, a lot of people think that, you know, he, he was still pretty hard up at the end of the war, but not, not a bit of it. What I have found is that his bank account at the end of the war had today's equivalent of four or five million dollars in it. Plus he'd bought a London house because he had, he had spent much more time during the war on his own affairs than people think. I mean, he spent it efficiently. He was decisive, but he did spend a lot more time. And it was American money that really came to his aid. And then he made more by selling his war memoirs, as I started out with, and History of the English-Speaking Peoples. So it was a painful experience for him. It was a hard learning lesson, his time in America. You know, it, it gave him a very hard time in the 1930s. But ultimately, it made a, a huge difference, not only to Britain's war strategy, but also to uh, his own financial fortunes. And he left an estate of about today's money, um, uh, seven or eight million dollars. He'd already passed on a lot to his children. And now, uh, anything that he has touched, his paintings, even his dispatch box, his dispatch box, which he paid, I can see, five guineas for in 1921, was sold at auction last year when his daughter, Mary Soames, died. Her children sold it off, and uh, the hammer fell at... Um, $300,000. So there, I've just tried to give you a bit of a taste of the vicissitudes of Churchill's financial fortunes and the very large part that America played in it. Uh, there's much, much more. It's been huge fun to research, and I think 
I hope you'll find it huge fun to read as well. And with that, I think I'll turn myself over to, to any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a question, so just refresh my memory. Uh, Winston Churchill had an older brother, Randolph, and therefore because of primogeniture, the control of most of the estate would have gone to the older brother, is that correct? No, uh, actually Winston was the older brother. Winston was the uh, older Of his generation, there were two, Winston and Jack. Oh. But his father, who was Randolph, was the younger brother oh. of the seventh dukes. The seventh duke's sons. The, the seventh duke had um, two sons and six daughters. And uh, Randolph was the younger brother. So nothing... Uh, you know, none of the major estate went to Randolph. Right. No. Common amongst, you right. know, first got the lot, really. <laughs> preserves the estate instead preserves of... Preserves the uh, estate, yeah. If the estate was worthy enough, then the younger sons were looked after by a sort of an outlying farm or, you know, land. That was the way it happened. And uh, sisters were looked after by diaries when they married. They were given the cash diary. Part of the problem with the whole sort of British landowning system was that people were living much longer by this time, by the late 19th century. And so the estate system had been sort of geared up. It depended on people dying early and not, not having to, the, the estates not having to support too many people. But as life expectancy went up, the, the people living off you know, an estate that hadn't really grown was, going up, was, was increasing. And so the drain on the uh, estate from paying the widow's portion, the diaries for the um, daughters, and anything that could be spared for the younger sons, you know, that amount, those drains got bigger and bigger. And that, that the price of wheat plus agricultural depression, you're yeah. absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, these two factors together sort of conspire to them. To, to, to lead to a huge transfer, really, of power and resources in, in British society from the aristocracy in the early part of the 19th century to this new generation of um, people who made their fortunes in um, railways or mining or banks or newspapers you know, who, who come through at the end of the 19th century. Was uh, Consuelo Isnaga, the Cuban sugar heiress, one of his ancestors? She married, the she married um, Consuela van der Bilt, as she became, yeah. was married to his cousin, oh. the, um, the ninth Duke of Marlborough. Oh. Yes, van der Bilt money um, introduced electricity and um, modern drainage to Blenheim Palace. Uh, I mean, there was a, you know, because of the, the stresses that the British aristocracy were under from agricultural depression and from longer life expectancy, uh, there was a market for, and, and it was a consenting two-way market for marriages between, weddings between um, British aristocrats and American heiresses. And there was a magazine, there was a whole industry surrounding it. You know, there was an official magazine in which they sort of advertised. <laughs> and um, it's just sort of today's forerunner of internet dating. Um, yeah, and, and uh, the Duke of Marlborough set out to, um, to find uh, an American heiress who could help him transform Blenheim. And that was Consuela. And, or Consuelo, she... Uh, I mean, she did her job in two ways. First of all, you know, she brought a lot of money with her. And secondly, she produced a male heir very quickly. But the marriage was very, very unhappy and uh, didn't last. Churchill was asked by his cousin, the Duke, to try and broker uh, a satisfactory, amicable solution. And all his sympathies were really with Consuelo. You know, he, he thought his cousin behaved very badly and he wasn't able to effect a reconciliation, but he remained a friend of hers throughout her life. She married a Frenchman, Jacques Bassin, and uh, that was a very happy um, marriage, and uh, I think she genuinely found real happiness with him. With the deputies first 
Death duties first came in in, in the late 19th, right at the end of the 19th century, in, in about 1895. So they, they weren't part of what Lord jo Lloyd George brought in, which was considered sort of punitive of the landowning class in, in the 1909 people's budget, but he did increase them then. But they had actually been brought in by a, a Tory administration at the end of the 19th century. I grew up to, in England to believe that uh, Churchill was the greatest man of our times. Um, any comments on that? Well, I, I mean, I, I think if you read my book, it's, you know, I, I actually I deliberately don't make any judgments about what I've been saying today. Um, because I want the reader to decide if it changes their view of him. I think it undoubtedly makes him more human. And part, part, part of, you know, there's so much has been written to lionize Churchill that he is, you know, to some degree, or, or he, he, he fails to be painted as a human being. But he, he was a human being with all the, um, I mean, many more strengths than most of us have, haven't, you know, far more strengths than most of us have, but also, um, in some respects, more weaknesses than most of us have. Um, he called himself a foolish moth, you know? And, and I mean, he, the, the fact that when he was owing everybody and, and the bank, he, you know, he, he had average debt levels in the 1930s of some three or four million dollars, climbing to five million dollars. His assets were worth virtually nothing. And yet every year he goes gambling during the summer vacation and he loses on average $60,000 a year gambling in the 1930s. So that's the foolish moth side. He also calls himself a downy bird. What he means by that is and he liked him, likened himself to his ancestor, the first duke, you know, who also had very bad patches. And if he was knocked over, he sort of picked himself up again, dusted himself down, and just got on with it, smiled, and you know, didn't bear anybody a grudge. <laughs> and you know, that's, that's the other side of him. I mean, what I, what I found was stupendous reserves of energy. You know, in the 1930s, when he's having to write like crazy to get himself out of this financial hole, he takes He's not only laying some bricks and doing some paintings, but he takes his books or his articles with him wherever he goes, 365 days a year, 24/7 almost. You know, he takes, he writes from sort of 10 at night till two or three in the morning, even on holiday. Um, when he goes on holiday, he's always scanning the news to see if there's something he can write about. So he has this fantastic reserves of energy, and he's very decisive. So I can see through, you know, through this prism, as well as the public prism, I can see all these great qualities, but there are also some accompanying weaknesses. Now, I, I, I don't think that makes him any lesser, uh, well, it certainly makes him, to my mind, even more fascinating as a human being. And I don't think it really detracts from his record. His record speaks for itself, you know, and I, I'm not trying to rubbish that at all. But what my editor said to me, he said at the end, of his editing. He said, David, thank you for making him more human than I've ever found him before. <laughs> and I was pleased with that because, you know, when you write a book that says money in its title, a lot of people think, oh, that's sort of dry stuff, isn't it, money? But it, it's, it, it needn't be, and it shouldn't be, I don't think. Does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> <That's a good laughs> so. yeah, I, I, get, I get the impression that the churches did very well in times of crisis. They seem to always rise to it, and the rest of the time, a lot less so. You know, there's yes. some, some, yeah, yeah, this includes John Churchill, yeah. Arabella. Yeah. I mean, you know. He, um. Well, you see, he, he was a huge risk taker. He was a huge risk taker in his private as well as in his public life. You know, if you think of the Dardanelles, if you think of crossing parties twice, these are big risks to take in public life, and, but he was quite prepared to take them. And, and he took these risks that I've been talking about in private life. Now, in the 1930s, the politics of Britain was such that nobody wanted to take risks. You know, the, the entire country was sort of still in shell shock after the First World War, really. Everybody wanted a quiet time. They didn't want to believe that Hitler was starting to rearm Germany and wanted to overturn the Versailles. And so nobody really listened to him in the 1930s. But, you know, when he, by the time he is made prime minister, we're in, Britain's in the last chance saloon. Um, there's literally, there's, there doesn't seem to be any other option almost. I mean, there, there was Halifax, you could say to me, but 
you know, in the end he didn't. He decided, he realized that he wasn't the man for it. So w we reached for Churchill because he was a, he was a risk taker in those, uh, what was needed in those circumstances was a risk taker. And I, I think that, um, which is another way of saying he's good in a crisis because he's prepared to um, take unpopular decisions, tough decisions, risky decisions. We have time for a couple more questions. I believe this gentleman in the second row had one. I was just wondering that uh, in 1931, I believe, Churchill was in New York and was in a severe automobile accident. Mm. Yes. Uh, did that impact him financially, or did he lose, or did he gain from insurance, or how did that impact <laughs> his life? Oh, gosh. Well, I'm, you'll have to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it did. It, it, uh, the, 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 the short answer is it reduced the profits of that lecture tour because it curtailed the lecture tour and, and he, could, he ended up with half the profits he'd hoped for. The even more immediate answer is that when he was lying in bed in hospital, he thought, I can make a story out of this accident. <laughs> and he, 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 did, he wrote a story and he sold it not only to a British <coughs> newspaper but to American newspapers and it made... You know, that article, I mean, he, he said it hurt writing it, but it made him forty or $50,000 in today's money. So even there, he's been knocked down, but he picks himself up and, and makes the most of the situation. Literally. I have a closing question. Ever so. since I saw the cover of the book, I wondered <coughs> if the phrase, no more champagne, was lifted from a letter or from a telegram. Is that a direct quote that you found in your uh, research? Uh, it, it is indeed uh, from a memo that he, that he wrote to his wife during one of seven um, economy regimes, which he um, proclaimed. <laughs> and uh, he said, this was one was in 1926. He said, no more champagne is to be bought. Now, actually, no more champagne is to be bought is a little different from saying no more champagne is to be drunk. <laughs> uh, and I suspect they carried on drinking it. But there was another one, number six economy regime, where it really got drastic. I mean, champagne and cigars had been exempted from all the other economy regimes, specifically exempted. But in number six, things are really bad. This is in 1937. And he says, no more champagne is to be served to guests. But for me, please reserve one pint a day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, folks, a reminder to our internet audience watching at home, you still have a chance to call the number on your screen, and you can get uh, No More Champagne shipped to wherever you are in the United States free of charge. For those of you here at the house, in the house, we have the book for sale at the counter in the front room over there. Mr. Locke will be signing here at the table to the left of the podium. And that was so much fun. Please give another hand to Mr. David Locke. Thanks very much.